et tere hommikust, hea ülikooli pere, et mitte öelda töökaimud. See on üks nendes sõnadest, mis sellel aastal sõnause konkursile esitati ja, ja ära märki, mis saavad, et kasutada kolleegide ja sõnad sõna töökaimud, nii et head töökaimud. Oleme täna siin selleks, et rääkida kasvuhoone kaaside inventuurist, mis on tehtud Tallinna Tehnika ülikoolile ja mida on vedanud meie enda, selle, seda inventuuri on vedanud meie enda ülikooli professor Kimmo Lülükangas. Minu nimi on Helen Sooveli Seping ja modereerin tänast üritust. Meil on täna rahvakalendri järgi kadu neljapäev, mis tähendab seda, et meil on mõned kaod kliimanutika tuleviku keskuse juht Epeglais haigestus ja mina modereerin siis tema asemel. Mida tähendab rahvakalendris kadu neljapäev? See tähendab seda, et toat tuleb teha korda ja tuleb anda võimalust uutele asjadele. Nii et selles suhtes on Olemegi täna natuke tähenduslikult siin, et rääkida sellest, kuidas tehnika ülikool saab enda kasvuhoone kaaside jalajälge, enda keskkonna jalajälge vähendada. Null punkt on meil olemas ja siit edasi järgnevad juba järgmised tegevused. Enne kui alustame päris selle inventuuri tööriista või vabandus tööriista tutustamisega annan sõna ka tehnika ülikooli rektorile, professor Tiitlandile. Palun. Aitäh, Helen. Tere hommikust. Nii siin tudengi majas viibivad kui ka Arvukad Teamsi kaudu täna sel seminaaril osalejad. Et ma loodan, et ei pane mulle pahaks, kui ma võibolla alustan natukene pateetiliselt ja võibolla ka patroneerivalt, et kui ma väidan või ütlen, et me meie tehnika ülikoolina ei tohiks olla lihtsalt pealt vaatajad ja kaasa elajad ja tunnistajad kliimamuutustele, temperatuuri tõusule, millega kaasnevad tihedad kuumalained, tihedamad kuumalained ka varem, tormid, üleujutused, põuad, suured rahesajud ja nii edasi, mis oma korda on ka päris kulukad meie ühiskonnale. Ja ma kindlasti usun, et enamus meist ja aga paljud meist tehnika ülikoolis tegelikult ei vaja seda nii-öelda patroneerivat nii näpuga näitamist ja, ja me tõepoolest ka ise saame aru, et, et me tehnika ülikooli me peame midagi tegema, pakkuma välja uusi lahendusi ja veel kord olles tehnika ülikool, enne kõike me ju töötame iga päev uute tehnoloogiatega ja tehnoloogiate õle töötamisega. Ja otsa loomulikult me mõtleme, mitte nüüd ei mõtle, vaid ka tegutseme selles vallas, et saada või pakkuda välja lahendusi, kuidas kasvuhoone kaaside suuremat õhku paiskamist hoida kontrolli ajal. Ja ka üks tunnistus või näide sellest ongi ka tänane seminaar või tänase seminaari sisu, kus siis me tutvustame, Kimmo, Lüluga, Kimmo tutvustab siis meie näelda äsja loodud uudset tööriista, kasvone kaalist mõõtmise tööriista ja tegelikult see teekond sai alguse juba mitmed aastat tagasi, et kui, ma, kui mina isiklikult natuke nüüd kolm aastat tagasi tehnika ülikooli tööle asusin siis ka minu rektoriks valimiste ajal oli üks, minu platform üks osa oli oligis näelda rohe ja jätkusuutikuse teemadega tegelemine ja kui kolm aastat tagasi tehnika ülikooli praegu naarengu kava 2021-2025 sai ka nõukogu poolt kinnitatud siis selles juba kolm aastat tagasi me kinnitasime ühe võitme näite, mis on kliimaneutraalne ülikool aastas 2035. Ehk siis me juba nägime, et me seame sihi väga-väga pikaks ajaks ette. 
Ja siis sellest tulenevalt me nägime, et meil on mõistlik, kuna me oleme tehniku ülikool, meil on omad tublid, head teadased, kes suudavad välja pakkuda nimetamist näelda täiendatud, need tööriistu mudelid on küll ja küll, kuidas kasvane kohase arvutatakse, aga eelkord me nägime, et me võiksime teha veel parema mudeli ja siis sellest turenevalt, kui ma olen hea meel, et professor Kimmo Lüljukangas siis võttis selle tegevuse enda vedada ja mida ta ka siis täna tutvustab. Aga nüüd on siis küsimus ka, et kuidas edasi? Meil on olemas tööriist, avatud koodiga tööriist, mida me loomulikult soovime pakkuda ka teistele Eesti ettevõtetele, loomulikult avaliku sektori enne kõik, aga mitte ainult avalikule sektorile. Me oleme arutanud veel ja siis nüüd sel 2012. aasta põhjal oma baas taseme, natukele 27 000 tonni süsinik dioksiidi ekvivalenti. Ja kuidas me nüüd jõuame siis või kuidas, mis on meie plaan, et jõuda aastas 2035 kliimaneutraalsuseni. Ja selleks jällegi loomulikult me kasutame ära meie teadlasi ja alles nüüd kakse minuti tagasi, täna hommikul enne, kui ma tulin siia seminarille, ma algirjastasin siis nende järjekordse töörühma või siis juhtrühma muudustamise korralduse, mida hakkab juhtima professor Jarek Kurnitski. See saab olema siis nüüd nimetamise üle ülikooliline teaduskondade ülene juhtrühme töögrupp nimetame projekte, mille siis nii-öelda ülesannev eesmärk on töötada välja kliimaneutraalsuse T-kaarteiniku ülikooli jaoks aastani 2035. Et ehk siis me saab olema 2024. aasta saab olema põnev juba enne suurt suve praeguste plaanide järgi töörühme esitab siis esimese nimetamise raporti või tööversiooni ja siis 2024. aasta sügisel oktoobri lõpuks töörühme peaks esitama siis lõppversiooni. See siis saab olema põnev teekond. Ja ma lõpetan sellega, et me loomulikult tehniku ülikool me mõtleme kasvone kaaside pehale, kuidas need vähendada ja mida me ise saaksime teha, et vähendada ja veelkord, et need tööd, mis on praegu tehtud ja mis on kavas, on üks näide sellest, on tunnistus sellest. Aga nagu me kõik teame, siis nendel päevadel toimub Dubais järjekordne kopp 28, mis kui ma tegi ette mäletan, kus siis arutatakse taas nimetus nüüd rohe pöörde või kasvane kaaside teemasid. Ka meil oli kutse seal osaleda, aga me see kord otsustasime mitte suure selskonnaga sinna kohale mitte sõita. Erinevalt teistest meist jaavali kõigusikest ülikoordist, vaid meie eesmärk on, et teeme kõigepealt oma kodukorda ja siis läheme võibolla ka kõnelda sellistel üritustele rohkem kaasa rääkima. Et veelkord sellega ma siis lõpetan oma sissejohatuse, soovin juba ette tänada Kimmot, kes tuleb ja siis esitlab meile, räägib meile siis sellest tööriistast, kasvane kaast mõõtmise tööriistast ja soovin ka loomulikult ette juba palju jõudu siis näeda nüüd asja just looduda juhtrühmale, kes hakkab siis koostama meie teekaarti, kliimaneutraalse teekaarti aastaks aastani 2035, et siis sellega ma annan sõna tagasi Helenile. Aitäh, rektor Piitland. Ja kodukord näeb meil ette nii, et kõigepealt tuleb siia tööriista esitlema professor Kimmo Lülükangas oma meeskonnaga ja see järel vastab siis ka Kimmo tiim küsimustele, mis teil selle esitluse ajal on tekinud. Põgusalt olete ehk jõudnud tutvud, aga ka tööriista ka endaga, mis saadeti eile ka kõikile soovijatele. Ootame teie küsimusi Teamsi, Teamsi chatti ja võtame need siis peale esitlusi. Nüüd aga palun Kimmo. Aitäh, Elen. 
Tere hommikust. Good morning. I will be presenting in English. And uh, together with me today, uh, Dr. Peter Valke and architect Kadrian Kertzmik will be presenting the methodology and the tool that we be, we've been completing. I will start by a brief overview of the report that was now accomplished and uh, just to show you what it what it contains. And uh, uh, after um, a brief introduction of the methodological content behind the results, I will give the floor to Peter and Kadrian. And um, uh, after I've concluded our part, I will give the microphone over to the developer team. Uh, we've had great developer team working on the tool and Jonas Nootinen from the developer team will be presenting the tool and demonstrating its use around, uh, well, in about 45 minutes. This is the report that presents the results of the 22 greenhouse gas inventory for Taltec. I will quickly show you, take you through the report. And um, basically the results are the same that we presented in June. But now the categories, as you can see here, are a bit different from what we were using in June. In June, I was talking about scope one, scope two, scope three, according to the standard that guides the calculation of corporate greenhouse gas quantification. These might not easily open up for someone who is not familiar with the greenhouse gas quantification standards. So here we are now using broader categories of transport, energy, buildings, waste, water, food, and goods and services that are more easy to associate with our activities. Uh, also, um, um, the results are slightly updated, not uh, content-wise, but the headcount number for Taltec has been now checked and it's more accurate. So the last decimal for our uh, carbon footprint has changed. Maybe some of you still remember that we were talking about, um, where is it here? Well, it's a minor minor correction, not actually resulting from the inventory itself, but the more accurate number for full headcount of Taltec. And after the results uh, that um, that are here briefly described, uh, we have annexes that open up the methodology, uh, actually all of it. In Annex 1, we described the method that we used. This is a hybrid method, and today we are going to tell you more about it, why we think it's the best way of quantifying the greenhouse gas emissions for a university, uh, what were the choices done on the way, and what is actually this tiered hybrid method that we are referring to. Then we are listing all the emission factors we have, uh, the sources for the methodological content, and uh, these are the emission factors. And today we are publishing also a database for emission factors, so anyone can access the emission factors that we're using in our inventory online in an emission factor database that I hope will uh, turn a valuable resource for all uh, experts in Estonia doing greenhouse gas quantification. They are also listed here in our annex, also the data sources for it. Then how we combined the expenditure from financial accounting and so-called exia based carbon intensities. This is also opened up in our report. I will later explain what it is about. And then we have the tool documentation, how the tool was done. It's a professional browser-based tool, free of charge, available for anyone through our website. And finally, the terms and abbreviations uh, for someone who is not familiar with them. So I hope that this report uh, pretty much implements the so-called track principles uh, as um, articulated by Greenhouse Gas Protocol, referring to transparency, relevance, accuracy, and completeness, and consistency in reporting. By publishing all this, we, we want to, of course, um, expose the work we've done. If you see something that you are not uh, happy with, if you are not uh, if you don't uh, find our emission factors acceptable, for example, please let us know. Because the objective is that by every year our inventory is better and better in quality. 
uh, this is not the uh, end of the inventory work, but the start of the inventory work. This is something that we would like to develop as annual practice within our organization. So without any major effort, in the end of every calendar year, we would be able to report the greenhouse gas emissions. And we aim at also proving a declining trajectory in the greenhouse gas emissions. The first one is the most difficult one, as we have to invent the categories to report with and uh, to find the data collection ways inside our organization. And next, I will start with my presentation and take you through the methodology that we were using. This was the project, in-house project financed by Taltec. We produced this first inventory, proposed the categories to report with, the method to apply, and the thing called greenhouse gas quantification model. For me, this model was always a bit difficult word because it can be, mean so many things, but I have a proposal what Taltec model could, could mean. We have now the baseline year results. What are our emissions today? We can continue on that track uh, and improve the results every year. But we also want to have a societal impact. We want to share the method as we applied it, the method that we considered the best, most relevant for an organization like ours to any organization or company in Estonia to use. And also the emission factors that tend to be the bottleneck of the quantification. Uh, this work was uh, very uh, consistently supported by the Taldec Climate Neutral University Working Group, and it was initiated by Helen Sobelis Epping, who has to be credited at this, this point. And also I want to highlight the great input from Tarmo Richard Klamp, who was uh, constantly working to find the sources, the data inside our organization. And we have so many reports and journal articles saying that the most difficult part of this work is actually the data collection as we are collecting data that we haven't searched before within the organization. So we have to find the ways where this is sourced and uh, make it an annual practice. And, and for this, Tarmos contribution was really instrumental. Furthermore, I have to uh, especially uh, mention the great contributions of um, Madis Markus and, and his team, and Rina Uska and her team, providing all this data that was needed for this inventory. Yes, we were quite confident that we know the method that we have to use, but we wouldn't be able to collect this data without help of these organizations inside Taltec. The persons involved were quite many because we wanted to make this an in-house learning process. We even started the new course that is an Eurotech course this year. So we are providing this method methodology course for also foreign students. And I believe that it's quite a good course covering the ways you quantify the emissions for cities, buildings, organizations. These are different kind of methodologies developed in a fragmented way and not connected with each other. and. Uh, aimed for different purposes, but yet all aiming at reflecting on the same method, same phenomena, the greenhouse gas emissions caused by an organization or entity. And for the tool, we had the great team, uh, Vera, who is here today, developed a database that will be available for, for everyone. Um, I, I want to highlight the importance of the database because this is kind of a this is the authority for all uh, people working on, on greenhouse gas quantification. All the Estonian experts who work on greenhouse gas quantification, they know LIPASTA database by VTT Finland. They know DEFRA database by the British government. They are valuable sources of information for emissions, emission factors, without which we cannot do these calculations. In Estonia, we haven't had such emission factor database, but we will have now. So we are publishing all the emission factors that we were using for Taltec. And uh, we aim to continue publishing more emission factors to help to enhance greenhouse gas quantification in different sectors in, in Estonia. For the tool development, we had the team of Avoin RU that will be joining joining this session later today. Um, after a competition, we chose a Finnish team that is actually an association committed to developing sustainability tools that work on open source principle 
So kind of antithesis of, of commercial applications. We are putting everything openly available, full transparency according to the greenhouse gas uh, uh, accounting principles, even the code and emission factors. Anyone can have full transparency with this emissions accounting from, from emission factors to the methodology and uh, uh, very carefully professionally done uh, UX design for the tool. This is a browser-based free open source tool that, that can be accessed uh, right after this event and uh, we will continue working on the website called thg.ee that hopefully will turn into a hub of information on greenhouse gas quantification. This is where we are going to publish some guide videos and more tools, more emission factors to, to enhance with this um, uptake of this greenhouse gas quantification practice. I will start with reverse order. I will first go through the results. Now when they are restructured, then we go to the methodology and finally we will introduce the tool. These are the results now. Uh, uh, well, results are now based on the headcount and FT as calculated in here. I know there were some questions about how FT is calculated for students. The, the annual inventory practice will be taken over now by the Center for Climate Smart Future. And we, are promi we have promised to give them methodological support, but this unit will now be responsible for doing tell the greenhouse gas inventories annually. And already the next uh, inventory report will be uh, prepared by this unit. And uh, we will produce then calculations and provide the methodological support. And, and here already we were able to collaborate. So the Center for Climate Smart Future was checking these numbers with the TALDEC organizations, including HR and, and um, all the relevant units. And these were now confirmed. And, and this is important because we want to announce the result by headcount. Why not also by FTE, the full-time employee? And according to our proposal, the so-called inventory units or, or organizatory units are these eight. And this enables uh, comparison of the units and monitoring of the development of the emissions. It would have been much easier to just report one number for the whole TALDEC but it's much more useful to break it down into eight units and now we can monitor and compare the results. And the results are here. The gray numbers are percentages for the total TALDEC emissions. You can see how it divides between other, Mustama and other campuses. Mustama, of course, dominating. You can see it, how it divides between transport, energy, buildings, waste, water, food and goods and services. Right after the June event, I was asked, what is the percentage of transportation emissions? It was difficult to answer. And, and why? We had the data, but according to the standard, according to the scope one, two, and three, the transportation emissions are included in several scopes. So you have to basically combine these numbers from different scopes to be able to tell the one percentage for transportation. And for this reason, we now created this new categorization for the results that hopefully turns out to be useful for uh, communicating the emission sources. This is how it is uh, presented as graphics. Most likely the future years will show up that there might be some data flows missing, even monetary flows missing that we weren't able to catch up. Right now we only know the food, the canteen food that was missing from our calculation. The agreement with the contents was just ending and they were not very uh, interested in providing any data that was like uh, looking to the past. Now we have new operators in the canteens and there will be much better collaboration and we'll be able to report also the canteen food part here. Um, my uh, expert opinion is also that our numbers for waste seem to be quite small. I think that we, we need to pay more attention to be able to track down all the waste flows and how they are calculated so we can expect this kind of improvements in the future. But all in all also what is happening everywhere globally all the time is that the providers of the services and goods are able to provide the carbon footprint for their product. Every year we have more emission factors available. So also for this reason, every year's inventory will be better than previous one. 
because we have more knowledge on the products, on the product level and service level. And these are the main sources of emissions here. Uh, just to point out, so energy is dominating in many other universities graphs. You can see that energy is next to nothing. This is because they apply so-called green electricity agreements. That explains the differences if you compare the results with different universities. We have buildings that refers to maintenance and renovations. We have transportation. And the one with 18.1% is goods and services that is like mixed package of all kinds of procured goods and services for the university. Uh, uh, that is probably the most difficult one to quantify. And this is what the other universities and organizations are also reporting. But our method actually provides good support for that. This is by location. So you can see that the most of my emissions are dominating the emissions. There are other interesting uh, percentages here as well. The Maritime Academy, Estonian Maritime Academy in Copley, dormitories and sports hall have a significant share also in this number. And if we move on, uh, you can compare the organizations by the percentages, how the emissions consist, uh, come together, what they consist of, and what is the share of uh, transportation, for example. You can see that Tallinn-based units have the smallest shares actually uh, for transportation. Then, um, yeah, I won't go into details here now, but uh, this enables us um, some comparisons between the units. And per headcount, the results look like that. Our report also provides some explanations why the Tartu figures are so good here. It's because of the floor surface area mainly, because uh, many of these emission sources are related to the building stock available per unit, and uh, in, in Tartu that's rather small. And the Taltec total here includes also the dormitories, the student dormitories in Viruma and, and Mustame, and also the sports hall facilities. So it is not uh, directly just these five units, but also including these additional units. And the baseline scenario, why, why we are doing this? Um, this is um, a simple future protection, as, as just assuming that uh, only the carbon intensity of the grid electricity will be changing. And, and this is probably the most solid future scenario we can apply. And uh, all the rest of it would be very soft. So usually we don't include these kind of assumptions into the baseline. But how we work with the baseline, now when we are planning the climate action at Taltec, uh, the impact assessment, it takes place uh, on this graph. If we time the new activity, for example, on 26 in here, there will be a peak, small peak in 26 usually, as we invest on a renovation, for example. On that year, we consume more materials to improve a building. Right after that, the energy consumption will be lower. And from 27 on, we will see a reduction of emissions as a result of this renovation. This is rather typical profile for an impact assessment to display the impact of a single uh, measure to reduce the emissions in, in overall emissions for, for organization. There are also measures that only cause reduction, but they are rather few. They could be, for example, policies. If we all decide that, no, we won't drive a car at all for one week or for one month, that kind of policy measure would just cause reduction, but they are actually rather few. Usually typical policy measures first cause some investment in emissions and then after that a reduction that is more permanent. And, and the timing, uh, the impact will is dependent on time. That's why we need the baseline scenario to assess the future impacts of these climate policies and prioritize them. And now I move on to, to the methodology. You are welcome to ask questions and point out mistakes if you see any. We are very happy if you find some because then next year's inventory will be better and that's already under preparation with the Center of Climate Smart Future and uh, will be better than this one, more accurate, more emission factors available, data sources improved. Methodology, the foundation as I, I uh, described in June, is a standard like documentation by greenhouse gas protocol. I wouldn't call it a standard as it is not a, by an organization like uh, CEN or ISO. 
but uh, it is always referred to as a standard. It's actually a guideline, but it's so widely adopted in, in corporate greenhouse gas quantification. That it's like standard, like set of guidelines. And this is where the scope one, scope two, scope three idea comes from. Uh, and this is also where the principles of transparency, relevance, accuracy, completeness and consistency come from. We try to uh, implement them systematically in our practice and descriptions of the scopes. Scope one and two are typically rather easy to cover. Scope three, always the most complicated one, the value chain emissions. And, and this is uh, something to, to which we wanted to respond with our methodological approach. In the greenhouse gas quantification in general, there are two main approaches, process LCA and input output methods. Our method is a hybrid method combining both. And uh, in, in Estonia, our most important reference point is the method or model published by the Ministry of Environment in 22. It's available on that website. Uh, it consists of a guidebook and an Excel calculator. Our project wanted to take kind of a one step further from this model that is authorized by the ministry. We extended the number of emission factors and we created a tool that is a browser based, more user friendly than the Excel sheet in here. And hopefully this way can support the uptake of the methodology. But methodologically, uh, the hybrid method is the main improvement or uh, advance that we were able to introduce compared to the ministry model. Uh, I will try to explain that rather soon. But before that, uh, I also want to point out that the ministry model uses these CO2 uh, equivalent conversion factors from AR4, the fourth assessment report. So we were also we were also leaning to this. Uh, it would be impossible to update all the emission factors according to the most recent uh, assessment report in this time frame. And as you can see, the weighting of different greenhouse gas gases is, has been changing. So the uh, impact of fossil methane is now uh, assumed a bit higher than what it is in AR4. And uh, But now our model is now based on uh, AR4 uh, factors because this choice was done also in the minister model and we considered it's this as a baseline or the, the basis, the foundation for our method and didn't want to change that. And this is reflected in emission factors that uh, combine the uh, different uh, compounds causing global warming, their impact depending on their uh, presence in these, these um, emission sources. The calculations themselves in the ministry model are not higher mathematics. It is activity data that you find inside your within your organization and then emission factor. And the problem we discovered in the ministry model is that you are easily guided by the, the availability of the emission factors. So if you have only 15 emission factors, you are attracted to do your calculation using those emission factors. And then you might not be covering all the climate impacts of your organization. For example, if we would only use the emission factors of the ministry model, we would show you now a carbon footprint that would be half of the number of the day just simply because it doesn't provide emission factors for all the impacts that our organization has. And this was the problem that we wanted to address. Um, our organization is kind of information intensive. We are not producing uh, metal products or furniture or anything like that. That's why our emissions emphasize so-called upstream activities. What happens with the energy, fuels and goods before they arrive at Baltic? They have to be included and they are included in our model, in our inventory and in the tool. But I want to show this also because if a company would like to use our tool, it is very well suited for the companies, but we are at the moment, we are not providing emission factors for manufacturing industry because we didn't need them for our own inventory. So we are now focusing on this box. We have an emphasis because of our, of our own activities. And what this upstream means is that um, if we if we drive a car, if we drive a Taltec car, there are emissions from uh, fuel combustion in the car. They are direct emissions, so-called tailpipe emissions. But before the fuel arrived, uh, before it uh, entered the, the tank of the car, there was processes that also have to be included. 
And typically in these methods, we are using two emission factors for that, so-called upstream emission factor, and then the direct emissions emission factor. Whenever we, are, we can apply an LCA method that is more detailed, then this is referred to as module A. We calculate the process, uh, cradle to gate, how it was transported to Estonia, possible installation of the product. And this is what is allocated to Taltec in the year when this product was purchased to Taltec. And then we have the use stage. If you think of computer, for example, the computer or laptop manufacturing is included in Taltec emissions during the year when we purchase this laptop to Taltec, including the whole chain from raw materials to the factory gate, transportation to the Estonian shop, and furthermore to our IT department. No matter when it took place, it is allocated to us and during the year when it was purchased. And after that, the use of the laptop is reported in energy because it mainly uses energy, no maintenance needed. And when it's uh, finally disposed, when it's thrown away, then we have to report it as waste. This is how LCA approach and uh, this uh, organization greenhouse gas quantification model meet. And one of our great benefits is that uh, unlike any other organization in Estonia, we have an expert who can do contact full LCA for possible new buildings that we build or any major renovations that we do. And uh, you will hear more about this today. But I wanted to explain why we have two emission factors for one activity data. If we use energy, fuel, things like that, there is also this upstream to be covered and it is covered now in our model. Why we are using the hybrid method, I was already referring to that we would like to first understand what causes emissions in our organization during one year. And this shouldn't be dependent on availability of emission factors. It, it shouldn't be a, a factor that stops us from accounting. Um, and uh, the method that uh, we immediately wanted to implement here is called tiered hybrid method. Hybrid method means that we combine the two main emission calculation methodologies, input-output method and this process LCA. And tiered hybrid method is widely applied in academic literature and, and also all the commercial tools today for organizations, they apply hybrid method. But maybe the tiered idea here that structures the data quality is not included in these tools. And for sure, they are not showing this structure in the tools, they are not transparent. This graph here tries to explain the tiered hybrid method idea. We have to use the scopes as it is in our standard. We have to follow the standard and report by scopes. If we will have in the future a third party validation, it will be based on reporting by scopes. So we cannot avoid it. We have to report by scopes. And uh, the tiered hybrid method means that we are evaluating the data quality in, in um, terms of tiers that come from IPCC methodology. These three tiers are described by IPCC in their guidebooks, but we are adding this input-output result as tier zero, the most inaccurate data layer, results layer in the calculation. The highest accuracy is on tier three, then you calculate in, by the most accurate method available for different, for each uh, uh, emission source that you are accounting for. Tier zero is the least accurate layer, but the coverage is excellent because here now our financial accounting for 22 converts entirely into the emissions. So any action that goes through our accounting converts into emissions. And this kind of guarantees that we are not doing double accounting, we are not having overlapping categories, but we don't have gaps either. So anything we did that caused any costs is included in our carbon accounting without overlapping or gaps. However, we know that there are at least two categories that we need to add here. There is uh, commuting, the daily work from, from home to work. This is not going through Taltec accounting and the canteen food. At least these two categories have to be added. Maybe some more, but at least these two. But otherwise, any activity that Taltec has done in 22 is now included. And uh, even though the accuracy might not be the best, it is still rather good representation of these, these emissions in our inventory. And this is extremely valuable in scope three that is usually considered the most difficult one to, to calculate. Now we can cover it, we can cover it entirely 
using this method. Uh, is TR0 then very inaccurate? No, it's not. Peter will soon talk about that. Uh, it represents uh, product and service categories. So we have Estonian average carbon intensity by a product category or service category for this year that we are now inventing. And Peter will tell more about it. When the University of Helsinki was doing their calculation, they first accounted for all the emissions through this method, input-output method, and then applied more accurate methods. The difference was only 3% in total. So it can be very accurate. If the company is very small, they might be purchasing very specific products, and then it doesn't match with the average value for the product category. There you might have some problems, but in a big organization like ours, the selection of materials included in each category pretty much averages out and we can pretty much rely on these results. However, the idea of our model is that this is what we start with. This is called screening in greenhouse gas protocol guidelines. We understand where our emissions are and we start calculating them more accurately in order of significance. So first we calculate very accurately the energy, because this is where our emissions come from. Then we move on to other sources like transportation, goods and services, and try to cover as much as, much as possible with the most accurate methodology. And what are the tiers here then? According to the IPCC description, tier one is a national average methodology. So if we are using for transportation, for example, average Estonian car emission factor then we can say that, yes, we are a bit more accurate than when calculating with euros, but it's still rather generic. Tier two is organizational level. If we know what the Taltec cars are on average and use an emission factor for Taltec cars, including diesel, fuel, hybrid cars, then we could be on tier two. And tier three is the most accurate one, usually a project-based uh, result that describes, for example, if we would know exactly the car fleet of Taltec employees and students and even the driving profile they have, we would be able to calculate on tier three level. And the aim is that uh, by the years we have more and more uh, emission sources calculated with tier three accuracy. Uh, this year in 22 it was um, uh, 60 61% was calculated by tier one, two or three using process-based LCA. And, and 39 with uh, tier zero using expenditure from input out. And this is a number that we expect to increase every year. And now I was asked what is asked what was the Taltec model then if we if we are to describe what what did we what did we develop here? We have a Taltec accounting data for every year available. We have the scopes and the standard and the guidelines how to report it and calculate it. The model is how this is combined. So first, we need to calculate from axio based the Estonia specific numbers, and this is what Peter is going to talk about. They are not readily available. They have to be calculated from there. Then we have to be able to assign these carbon intensities with our accounts. This is also included in our model. Then we have to assign these results with the framework of scopes. This is also included in our model. So under which category we report these emissions. And furthermore, as I explained, uh, the results by scopes might not be very informative as there are fragmented uh, inputs for transportation and so on under each scope. It's better to combine them to be able to tell what is the percentage of transport emissions, for example. We also have this categorization proposed in our model and how the standard categories come together as more useful more generic categories for Taltec. And this is all proposed, maybe this could be called the Taltec model, how we operate with the standard, how we integrate in the expenditures from our accounting, how we use that data, how we improve the accuracy year by year using higher and higher tier of calculation, and then how we finally report them so that they become useful information for climate action inside Taltec. Now I'll leave the floor to Peter, and Peter, please take over. Dr. Peter Walke is, is working as an expert in Stockholm Environment Institute, that is one of the leading experts in 
in climate issues in Estonia and also as researcher in, in our unit and has been working on input-output methods for the inventory and for the tool and will now briefly take us through how the methodology for input-output uh, method works in, in our model. So, Peter, please. So thank you, Kimo. Um, I will unfortunately also uh, speak in English, um, so I apologize for that. Um, so so as, as Kimo said, we know that nowadays many emissions are kind of these scope-free emissions, which um, you can also say another way are emissions that are produced in one place due to activities or services and goods that are developed to be used in a different place. And environmentally extended input output is a method that attempts to um, calculate or take into account these emissions through tracking um, them through global supply chains using economic units. So it does this by using kind of an input output approach, which is an attempt to describe an economy um, using a matrix, which basically breaks it down into different products and services and also describes the interlinkages and transactions between those different services and goods through the economy. And formally, emissions are calculated using the equation we have on the, on the screen here. And um, here there are kind of three sort of important terms to consider. So this, this value E kind of describes um, the emissions that are generated from each product or service in an input output table um, for one euro worth of that product or service being produced. And this term A kind of is a, is a, is a term that describes the transactions or flows of um, products and services through an economy. So for instance, it might describe how much of product A is needed to produce product B and stuff like that. And finally, this term Y um, is a term that describes the expenditure of a, of, of a consumer, such as a university or, or a nation or, or even a household on each product and service in the economy. And if we combine all of these together, then we can get greenhouse gas emissions as the output. And in, in actuality, it's not particularly different to an activity times emission factor equation. If you take this EL term together, that, that is essentially like an emission factor, but it takes into account this um, fact that some of the emissions that what might be caused by one category are actually the result of activities in a different category. And instead of using tons or kilowatt hours or something like that as the activity unit, we use uh, economic units. So we use euros or we use dollars. So emissions calculated this way are typically also known as consumption-based emissions as they use the consumption of, 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 of goods and services as the basis for um, deciding who's responsible for particular emissions rather than looking at the area in which they are produced. And a, a good thing about this type of methodology is because it uses economic units, it scales very well across different spatial scales. And that means you essentially use exactly the same method if you want to calculate a carbon footprint, footprint for a country or a region of a country as you do if you want to calculate the emissions for, for a household or for an organisation. And, and yeah, the, the, the crucial advantage is that it takes into account this outsourcing of emissions that that takes place globally, where where one region of the world might be responsible for producing a particular good and service that is used in a different region of the world. And I just included here um, an example calculation for different countries from the year 2015. Um, and of course, the the values of emissions are very different as as they are in any sort of emissions inventory. Um, but it's important to note that this is not scaled for population. So it shows that um, China has the highest consumption based emissions if you look at uh, it on a country basis. But if you were to scale this for population, then countries such as the United States or Canada or many European countries would actually end up having higher emissions than, uh, than, 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 than China. Um, and like any any method you use for anything, it has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. And, and, and I think chemo has discussed this anyway, but I will also do so in a little bit more detail and compare it to process-based LCA. So the, the, the key advantages of an input output method are that it uses kind of uh, 
so-called top-down data. So this is nationally compiled data, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage. It's an advantage in the sense that the data is all in one place. And once it's compiled, you only have to look in that one place and all the data can easily be used together. But the, the key advantage is that it um, has a, a level of um, completeness that is difficult to find anywhere else because it, it includes, by its nature, all of the supply chain emissions that exist and can be tracked through um financial financial data and indeed when you do a kind of eio calculation you generally will include all of those emissions as standard the key sort of downsides apart from this top-down data which also has problems with with uh, precision or specific specificity are what's known as aggregation errors which um basically means that you have to describe an economy as defined by a certain number of products, as, as Kimo said, and this necessarily means you have to aggregate certain things together that might not be exactly the same. And this introduces a degree of averaging and therefore errors. A, a, a second kind of um, problem you, you, you can have is that the uh, amount of data you need to first compile in output tables is very large, and this tends to mean that the data that describes sort of... Um, the supply chains throughout an economy are, are usually a few years out of date by the time they can be used. Um, if you were to look on the other side of the on the other side of the coin, uh, um, process-based LCA, this has the advantage of using um, data that is usually very locally available or precisely um, covers the activities of a, of an organisation or or, or 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 such. And this means that it's quite a precise calculation. But it is also very labor intensive and can't, as I said, cover a lot of emissions. And it also suffers from something known as truncation errors. And, and this actually derives from the, the, the intensity of it. And it means that there is a certain point in the supply chain of a process based LCA account where it's simply not possible to account for emissions anymore. And the accuracy of a process based LCA um, uh, inventory will necessarily depend on the size of these truncation errors and these can be large and they can be small and it secondly actually means that any process-based LCA or pure process-based LCA inventory you, you you get will will be an underestimate of your true emissions because there are certain things that are just not included. Um, so to, to, to summarize the advantages of uh, environmentally extended input output, I would say that it covers more emission sectors and more of those emissions than process-based LCA, but does so with greater individual sources of inaccuracy. And as, as a result of this, um, kind of the cutting edge of, of research, and in, indeed what we used is a sort of hybrid approach that combines the advantages of, of both approaches into a single, into a single inventory or, or model. So to discuss the results we produced in a bit more detail, we used um, a, a multi-regional input-output um, database called Exiobase, which has a description of the economies of all, all of Europe, essentially, and, and the big global economies, and defines each as being consisting of 200 different products and services, and each of these have um, a, an associated emission factor or an emission intensity that you can uh, calculate. And we aligned this data with accounting data from the Taltic accounts, specifically accounts number that begin with numbers 55, five, which describe operating expenses, and 15 that describe investments. And as uh, Kimo said, we used this data for screening initially of the emissions and also to um, estimate difficult emission sources, so typically a lot of the scope free emissions. And the, the graph here shows actually the, the scope free emissions that we, we used in the uh, in the final inventory. Um, so it shows um, kind of that there is no one source of emissions that is, is so much higher than all of the others anymore, but that there are lots of sources of emissions that, 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 that contribute small but significant values to the overall um, picture. However, when we did the initial screening of the results, um, it became very clear that electricity and heating were, were, were very significant sources of emission. And this clearly pointed the picture of where we needed to focus a lot of our efforts to, to, to get a more accurate picture for the emissions inventory. Um, and I uh, will now pass over to Kadrian to talk a little bit more about this and also the uh, renovation emissions. So 
My name is Katrian Kirtsmik. I'm a PhD student at Talte and my supervisors are Kimmo Lilikangas and Targo Kalamas and my focus is on renovation, apartment building renovation and their carbon footprint. Therefore, I'm quite familiar with this uh, current standard, what you can see. Uh, this is a uh, European uh, national standard, uh, 15978, uh, and it, uh, it is used for building carbon footprint calculations. The yellow part in, uh, in this graph is uh, what, uh, what they used for our Taltech inventory. The reason is why, uh, because uh, these are the missions what, uh, which are happened uh, right now uh, the further modules like P, uh, U stage, and C, uh, end, end of life scenarios are happening in the future, and therefore we are not taking it into account in, uh, in our 2022 inventory. Uh, for the module B, uh, for example, uh, if we are going to repaint some walls, at, like in uh, five years, then uh, these emissions uh, will be affected in. Uh, in, uh, in an inventory 2027 as a work uh, which happened uh, in this uh, precise uh, year. That's the reason why uh, we are using, uh, or I used uh, the LCA method and only the module A, because uh, these are emissions which uh, occurred in 2022. It included uh, material transport, their production, uh, transport uh, to, to Talte, and also the construction construction and installation part. And uh, I also have uh, this slide about the renovation. Uh, here you can see that uh, uh, renovation works included uh, three uh, biggest, uh, three biggest uh, projects. Uh, and the reason was, was so because um, these are the project uh, which has, uh, which had a proper design project, construction-based project, uh, what I can use, and also cost, cost of bill, uh, which, which were used. And uh, these were shared with me that uh, from, uh, from a real estate uh, department. And uh, as said, I used uh, two documents, construction project and construction budget information there. Basically, as Kimo said before, uh, it is based on uh, emission factor, which is, uh, which is uh, summarized with a uh, quantity. So basically, I was going through all the project uh, layouts, uh, calculating together how many square meters of wall were repainted, or how many uh, wood zone timber was used, for example, in the ceilings. And these kind of uh, really little detail were, were included. And uh, that's how this uh, renovation work uh, LCA results were given. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and Kadrian. I will take us next towards the tool and, and the database issues. And you will have an opportunity to ask questions, uh, post questions to all of us later. Um, just um, as a final slide about the methodology, how we can then develop the, the in inventory practice within Taltec. We have included the so-called accuracy indicator in our methodology that is based on the tier of calculation. What's the accuracy of the calculation method? and what is the share of those emissions that are being calculated. And for each year, we can calculate the value for accuracy indicator. And the idea is, of course, that this would be constantly improving towards 100. If, if we have uh, a just uh, expenditure data from accounting available, that's tier zero, and the indicator for accuracy would be zero, although we would have a result. If all the results would be calculated on tier three, the best level, this would be rather unique inventory. I don't know any of the, that kind of inventories, but that would be of top quality. Then the indicator would show 100. So 100% of the emissions would be calculated on tier three. And this would be the way of monitoring the quality, the accuracy of our inventory by year. And, and hopefully it shows a, a rising trend while, of course, the total emissions should show declining trend. 
Uh, already, uh, right now, what we have in the tool is a data set for 22 and already for 23 data set of emission factors that will include a quite extensive set of emission factors for IT equipment. So we have collected uh, emission factors for different kind of laptops and IT device. So already next year, we are able to calculate with higher accuracy the impact of IT investments. Also, there are more emission factors available for different kind of product categories, and we are also developing the data collection practices within Taltec. So our tool will be able to read Excel files. We can spread out these Excel files to different units inside Taltec for accounting, for real estate to collect certain information about fuel use in research vessel Salme or fuel use in Taltec vehicles. And this can be then gathered together in the tool just by importing the Excel sheet and having a new inventory and the results can be compared with the tool. And in the tool, of course, we hope to see a declining trend where we do much better than the baseline scenario in redu reducing the emissions. Right. Um, tool in the database. So, like I told you, these kind of databases are quite influential and important hubs for information like DEFRA or CO2data.fi or Lipasto. And to my knowledge, we haven't had anything like that in Estonia. We do hope that this domain, THG.ee, will turn into that. Uh, you may ask why it's not Kahage, that wasn't available. We were able to register this, and I hope that it's simple enough to remember uh, and, and will also become an uh, important source of data outside the boundaries of Estonia. Next year, we will be producing datasets for Finland and Sweden as well, because one of the companies that was doing testing with our tool had operations in Sweden and Finland. And the database has emission factors that Peter was describing. The 200 exio-based categories are converted to Estonian carbon intensities, Finnish carbon intensities, and Swedish carbon intensities for 23. It also includes uh, emission factors for energy consumption, fuel, and, and uh, different kind of product categories. So I hope it turns out to be quite useful. At this point, we were not producing emission factors. But in our next project, we will also be doing that. The tool that uh, Jonas and Avoin team now will demonstrate to you is this here, tool one. We call it corporate greenhouse gas accounting tool, but it's for organizations. And right now it's readily available for Estonian universities or research organizations, for example, as it has quite good coverage of emission factors for, for this kind of organizations. And it will be accessible through ghg.ee that also has a direct access to the database. And database is an application that Vera has created. Vera works as full stack developer in our unit and expert and has created the database where we can easily upload new emission factor data sets and uh, update the old ones. And it has an API. API means an interface where we can automatically read the data. So our tool will read automatically the emission factors from there through API. So no manual import anymore. And this API is open. So if anyone wants to develop a commercial tool and thinks that Taltec has the best data set for emission factors, they are free to do so. And this continues. Um, why the corporate greenhouse gas quantification is important right now is that the European directive requires really large organizations to, to do ESG reporting next year, uh, focusing on this year's uh, activities, including the emission calculation. So we hope that this helps companies who either voluntary, voluntarily or driven by this um, directive start accounting for their emissions and monitoring them on an annual, annual basis. As you know, the world is full of tools like this. Now, when directive is there, everybody wants to develop their tool and solution and say that start your sustainability journey with our tool, 40,000 euros. Why is our tool special? It is free, it is transparent, and the most effective way of cutting your emissions is to do this work in-house. Any company that will start this work, I would recommend doing it in-house instead of hiring a consult because this data collection is done inside your organization and your external consult will not know where to find this data. Your organization knows. And once you do it yourself, then you also know where you can cut. 
your consult will not know. He will have a vague idea that usually it is cut in here or here, but you will know better when this knowledge is inside your organization, you are on top of this information and you know where to cut and when in a cost efficient way. And for this purpose, our tool is good. You can start using it for free. We promise to keep the database updated and we promise you support to start using it without leaning to commercial tools that are not transparent, they are costly, and then you don't have the first hand knowledge how and where to cut. So right now we can introduce the database and tool one, but already in April 24, they will be the next one. The tool two here is for carbon footprint calculation of buildings. And according to the Estonian Climate Ministry, this will be part of the building code and regulation in January 25. And Taltec is now on top of this, de of the, this development. Uh, professors Kornitski and Kalames and Kadrian in our team are working on the method description for the ministry. And our team is working on the tool development and emission factors. And again, we can publish these material emission factors in our database. In April, we aim at having 100 generic material emission factors for construction sector to use. Today, we have less than 50 emission factors that clearly are not quite up to date. We try to update them all and publish them in April through our database. Again, for the whole Estonian construction sector to use. And the tool there will be for construction sector too, for quantifying the carbon footprint for buildings and renovations available through the same website that hope, hopefully uh, will be used by the construction sector designers, carbon footprint calculation experts, project managers, whoever needs to know what is the carbon footprint of a building. So this is the future plan, but what we can show you now is the tool. It is fully operational. The database is fully operational. Uh, user manual is not there yet. The tool 2 is under preparation, uh, funded by Taltec and Ehitus Ehype. So uh, stay tuned. There will be more content all the time. And um, if we have now Jonas online, our teams, not yet. We have to wait a bit until he, he joins the teams meeting to demonstrate the tool use. Then, then we can um, have a small demo on the corporate greenhouse gas accounting tool. I will end my presentation with this photo that I took this morning. For the cover of the uh, greenhouse gas inventory report, I was trying to have this image for a long time. I went there in the morning and in the evening trying to find a good light and sun was always coming from awkward direction and never these steps didn't look as good as they look today. There's a declining trend in greenhouse gas emissions. Iconic view of Taltec. Everybody knows that it's Taltec without any text in it. Maybe the next report can have this image. Now, the first one is done already, but I wanted to take this and end, end this presentation with this, with this photo from this morning. Thank you. While we are waiting for um, Jonas from Avoin to join the teams, uh, we would be happy to answer any questions about the method. We wanted to start with the method because the method explains why the tool looks like that. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting. We definitely should uh, dive in in all these things and um, start to think over uh, our activities, our focuses. And this is why I want to ask you two questions. The first one you already mentioned that if we do things like this in-house, we will get the picture where to cut, where to, to optimize processes, where to, to make uh, things better. Um, is uh, the module at the moment already uh, feasible to, to have um, this kind of uh, analysis to, to optimize the processes? This is the first question. And the second one, um, which is better in, in um, Mm, uh, let's say uh, long term uh, time scale 10 years maybe 15 years period uh, which is a better way to uh, put some um, mm, global aims for Taltech 
uh, in uh, decreasing the, the footprint, is it better to have some, um, just a number, just to decrease from 27,000, uh, was it 1,000, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, I don't know, 20,000? Or we should state that we should decrease, let's say, 5 to 10% every year. Which one is better out of those two? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, for your support. I think uh, we are in a good position in our unit because our activities are always supported by our team. Um, to the first question, uh, yes, the model is ready for quantifying even small changes in emissions. So we wanted to keep the resolution of the inventory extremely high all the time. So that's why we didn't give up these eight units and just merge them into one, because then you have difficulties in quantifying an investment in Viruma, for example. How would you do that? It would somehow merge into the big package and you wouldn't see that. Now you can quantify it. And uh, also the LCA methodologies that Kadrian was proposing, they are directly compatible with this model. And typically, like I explained, there's first an investment of some kind that causes a small peak, and after that we get the reduction. And now this kind of additional graphs can be placed on our baseline scenario. They are small, but the cumulative impact probably will, will show some opportunities for reduction. So yes, it is ready for that, and, and uh, although the accuracy for purchased goods for some sectors uh, wasn't the highest possible, still we can display that, for example, if we can move from purchasing goods to purchasing services, or if we can compare purchasing low emission product instead of average product, it will show. The impact will be small, but the model is, is, can display a difference. Um, then for the second question, now I am a bit um, um, uh, careful what to say about this. Uh, the model, of course, provides is, us with a lot of uh, kind of uh, proposals or ideas that, hey, here we could cut something. But but as there's another working group actually working on this, we, we specifically planned not to propose anything as um, Professor Kornerski and uh, his team will dive, will delve into this question in detail, what is possible, what is feasible. And, and for every saving measure, there's also a price tag. Usually uh, very rare uh, policies come for free. So would be rather careful to, to propose anything. But as I already uh, showed one alternative scenario in June, I will refer to this, that if, if the electricity is uh, emission factor of the electricity can be affected, uh, the impact by 35 can be up to 40% of the emissions. So there is clearly something to, to look into as, as energy plays such a big role in the emissions. Um, transportation is of course, of course another thing. And um, maybe as a response, I want to highlight that once this energy part is dealt with, the whole graph will look totally different and other sectors will peak out. And these goods and services, we can expect that that will be peaking out as it's a collection of all kinds of goods and things that we need to buy for the university, from books to laptops and cleaning services. Uh, that is probably the most difficult to tackle and probably the most difficult to quantify. So I would say that the future work has to do with that. And, um, uh, and with the processes that don't necessarily go into specific products, but maybe ways we procure. So if our procurement system can ask for um, climate impact data from the products, or it can be even in some cases, some kind of uh, um, evaluation matrix, this could be systematically, this could have a systematic impact on the scope free emissions in, in, in that way. That is the diffic most difficult one, but um, probably the focus of the uh, center of climate smart future in the in the coming years. So sorry that I'm not able to give any more specific numbers on the reductions. Anything for Peter or Kadrian, please. Thank you. Very uh, good overview and I, I I I'm not sure whether I understood everything but uh, I had one question from the employee of university so I see 
it's a very good tool to account for things what we buy in, what we consume within university. But the, and it has been related to the number of people who are working at the university. But how to account to the number of outcome from university and how we relate to other universities with, with such data? Could you, do you have any? Yes, thank you yeah, for the good you. question. Our main impact on the climate issues is uh, immaterial and difficult to quantify. There has been attempts and even journal articles about so-called carbon handprint that uh, reflects this kind of impact in society. But as it is very experimental and not scientific yet, we haven't included that. There is a carbon handprint manual published by VTT and University of Oulu, for example, has published journal articles about handprint. There are research articles about the carbon footprint of research, but this is all very soft. So it's very experimental. There is no protocol to follow. And if we would do that, it would definitely not be a model for others to use because we are still searching for ways to quantify it. So therefore, we haven't included it in here. Um, but I hope that maybe in our journal papers we can address this question and, and propose some uh, possible ways of doing that based on what the other universities are doing. So the methodology for quantifying this impact is not there. And as you can imagine, it's quite difficult to, 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 to quantify it. If we establish a methodology like we now do for the Ministry for quantifying the greenhouse gases for all buildings, all new buildings in Estonia, if they set the limit value advised by Professor Korniski and our team, there will be reductions for coming decades quite much nationally. Can we allocate all of that to our university because we did the model or should it be allocated partially to the Ministry and us? These are the difficulties and uh, make the methodology rather soft. And that's why we are not even trying to capture this at this stage. But uh, it is a very relevant question and uh, I'm looking forward to see proposals from different parts of the world to, to somehow reflect on this significant impact that is just difficult to quantify. Uh, maybe just to add up, uh, um, uh, University of uh, Labenranta is uh, working on on this handprint uh, method uh, uh, heavily to sort of show uh, uh, show how how good they are in in uh, sustainability matters. But I have um, another question from Teams, um, and it comes from Professor Erki Karo. A really good one. Uh, for per capita calculations, can you explain why we treat students and workers the same if the E counts? Aren't workers supposed to be more in the campus than students? Contracts versus curricula. And if we communicate our footprint per capita, aren't we making our students look environmentally worse than workers? We have homes and workplaces, they have homes, workplace and university as footprint. Mm -hmm. Do you um, have any answer for that? Yes, uh, that's a good question, really, really important question. The reason to divide 27,000 tons per, uh, maybe not capita, but uh, per headcount as we did, makes the number more understandable. This is better, easily, more easily communicated like this. And that's why we wanted to use it. But as you could see, we were not using FTE for this specific reason that the accounting for FTE is problematic. At one point, I was thinking of calculating the FTE for students by the ECTS credits that they are expected to have per one semester and converting this into working hours, as we know the ratio. But again, we are quite on, uh, on soft side over there. Uh, so we are now using headcount as determined by HR unit of our university and not FTE for the specific reason that there is uh, softness in here. Uh, as it comes to other universities, it seems that there is a bit of variation in this practice. So there is no document that we could refer to that this is how universities should 
calculate the headcount. If there was, we'd be happy to use it. But now we were just relying on HR's um, averaged headcount number per unit. And uh, this uh, headcount number is important also when we want to understand the impact of different units. Because if you just would compare the absolute numbers without taking the headcount into account, that, that would be, of course, not informative and difficult to understand. Now, when we use the headcount, we are at least closer to understand which units have bigger carbon footprint and which one smaller. So maybe this is something that we can improve in the future. Maybe Greenhouse Gas Protocol or some organization like uh, Finland has this um, uh, collaborative organization for all universities working on climate issues. Maybe they come up with a proposal. Maybe we come up with a proposal with other Estonian universities. This is the way to calculate the headcount for students to be, make it fair. Then we'd be happy to use it. At the moment, to my knowledge, we don't have it and we were then forced to just uh, pick the best or least uh, misleading opportunity. But yet, per headcount is better than comparing the absolute numbers only. We have two more questions, but um, shall we uh, give floor now to Jonas Nautinen because he's online? Okay, good. Um, if uh, if we can then wait a bit with the questions and uh, ask Jonas Nautinen to to take over the screen and uh, uh, take us through a short demo with the uh, organization greenhouse gas quantification tool that we've created for Taltec. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. So let's take a look at the tool that we have developed uh, during this year. So this is a software as a service tool. Uh, works fully on the browser. So like any any other task tool, you first need to log in and then uh, the, the actual tool has two main uh, views. Uh, one is for the, for the inventory or the input data and uh, the other one is for the result or the output data. And let's go through each in more detail. So first of all, in both uh, views, uh, one user can have access to multi multiple organizations. So we can select which organization we are uh, reporting. And then uh, each organization can have multiple reporting periods. So for example, in this uh, Altec demo, we have now the reporting period for 2022, but we can also start a new period. So let's say we want to start a period for uh, 23. We could um, do it here. And then we would be able to switch between the periods. If we take a look at uh, how we can input data here, so we have um, these different emission categories, and um, let's let's say that we have now some business business trips to report. So, for example, there there have been uh, well, let's see. What, what, what kind of business trips we are able to report here. So we go to business trips and we select which uh, organization unit to count these trips to. So uh, let's select Mustama and then uh, we, we select the, the emission stores. So let's, let's say that um, we have done a business trip of 1000 kilometers with a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Um, and let's say it's a really, really luxury big car. 
we have different emission factors for different different sizes of cars and different different fuels and it's it was 1000 kilometers and uh, the accuracy is well let's select tier three i hope Kim, kimmo has explained uh, all of these uh, selections uh, before i joined um, and it's also good to mark uh, where this number was received from so that next year when reporting next year's emissions uh, there's some kind of uh, history or log that you, you can check where, where you gathered the numbers last year so it would make your make your life easier probably so let's say we we got this number from uh, uh, accounting department from Jane Doe and then uh, the pre-selected emission factors for this particular type of car uh, shows that uh, plug-in hybrid I, I guess it expects that uh, you uh, do shorter trips so that you fully you can fully uh, drive on electricity so that you don't have any activity emissions so it, it it's only kind of assumes the emissions of uh, electricity but let's say you select something else like diesel diesel luxury car uh, classic demo effect for some reason uh, we don't press uh, it, it doesn't show activity emissions while obviously there, there should be activity emissions for diesel diesel car but i guess there's something wrong wrong with the uh, database of these emissions but anyway this, this is now a good opportunity for me to showcase that uh, if we know that uh, it's we, we read some scientific uh, article that says that this kind of car has this emission factor, then we can uh, insert the source where we got that fact and use it as a custom emission factor. And when we save the emission, then it uh, already shows in the results. So now it's such a small emission factor, so it's really, really small. But we can also now edit so let's say I made a mistake that this uh, emission factor should have actually been uh, 1.057. Uh, so I can I can uh, edit edit whatever is input and and this was 2,000 kilometers kilometers instead of 1,000. We we can edit everything afterwards and then uh, the numbers immediately update here and for just uh, demonstration purposes let's also add a similar uh, number for some other organization unit so that we can We can, yes, it, it also shows you if you forgot to input something that's that's needed for the reporting. So uh, now we can see that there's actually Tartu has much more emissions in business trips than Mustama, which is probably not not accurate, but just for demonstration purposes. And also we can now here uh, filter these uh, business trips emission sources by organization unit. So if, if there's multiple, then they will uh, be appended on this list. And we can edit, edit each here. Going back to the form overview. Uh, so now we added some business trips. So it's clearly now visualized with a color that uh, we, we added, added business trips and whatever is white, still doesn't have any data so it's it's kind of visually displayed how complete the reporting is at any given time 
and this also uh, all the time updates the total emissions here on this uh, kind of uh, condensed uh, result overview. So it always shows the total emissions for the reporting period for the organization. It shows the direct emissions or scope one emissions, uh, indirect or scope two emissions, and value chain or scope three emissions, and also the percentage of uh, each. Also, it's possible to show um, emissions based on life cycle stage. So uh, activity means that emissions that are uh, generated by the actual activity, like burning of fuel. Upstream means that uh, emissions that have occurred before purchasing that uh, fuel, so manufacturing and, and other, otherwise. And also we have a separate section for biogenic emissions, which is not part of the and the total total emissions uh, because uh, the greenhouse gas protocol only tracks the fossil uh, uh, fossil fossil emissions in the in kind of the total scope one two three but but this also has the possibility to show bio, biogenic emissions for reporting purposes and then it displays uh, how these are kind of distributed. Uh, between the life cycle stages. Then if we go to the results uh, page, we can, we can see, well, first of all, the overview is the same than on the last page, but we can then view much more detailed uh, data of the emissions. So just a quick, quick look at how, how these are uh, displayed here. Uh, this, this is just a selection of graphs. It is rather uh, straightforward to implement any other types of graphs because the underlying data structure is is clearly clearly formatted. So so it's it's um, basically you can use the same data for different kinds of visualizations. But for example, we we in this uh, demo of the tool have selected a couple couple uh, that might be useful. So first of all, is just listing emissions by emission category. And these have been grouped into scope one, two, and three. And uh, then, um, for example, now scope one has been selected. So it displays, uh, I think it, it, it is for the lollipop chart, uh, it, it displays uh, how how the emissions are distributed between different emission categories of scope one. And then also when, when I joined, you were discussing the uh, and relative emissions per uh, different um, kind of dividers. So for example, head floor area or head count of students or full-time equivalent of students and employees. We don't have enough data in this demo to show any any useful visualizations here, unfortunately now. But but when when the real data is is uh, uploaded here, then then it would kind of show show you how how these different organization units compare uh, both in uh, absolute emissions and relative emissions based on these different dividers, and also it's possible to compare the total emissions, how, how they are kind of uh, distributed among different uh, organization units. And then we also have this kind of visualization uh, that um, shows more detailed information about each uh, organization unit. So basically this same data that's shown here in, in the total total category, but but for example, if you want to report uh, by organization unit or, or plan some reduction actions for a specific organization unit, you, you can you can see how how this number numbers differ between organization units and maybe prioritize actions differently depending on your location, responsibility area. And uh, finally, for one other 
type of uh, demonstration we we have here uh, the di distributions of the kind of uh, emission categories in each organization unit. But again, there's so so little data available. So maybe just for Mustama, this would then then show how many percentage of emissions come from each, each emission category. So this can also be really useful when prioritizing reduction actions. But like I said, it's possible to uh, build any any kinds of visualizations. Um, and also in an upcoming version, the, the, this is not not the latest development version, but we, we have now implemented new features which allow also exporting all this emission data as one big CSV file, so you can then build uh, build from that data in Excel, for example, and build custom custom uh, charts based on that data. Also, there's a new feature for importing data from from Excel files, so so it, it should then um, reduce the amount of manual typing of data and and also some other other new features that will be will be introduced uh, in the next next release but i i think that that was in a nutshell what what has been implemented so far for this tool and i i'm happy to answer questions related to the tool if, if that's appropriate for the agenda of the uh, of, of, of this meeting or otherwise thanks for the interest thank you jonas um, um uh, we are happy to see that um, the law of Mur murphy is still in force as the um, things don't work online um uh, when they are <laughs> somehow uh, stressful uh, please uh, stay online uh as we might have questions for you, and I, I kindly ask you to come over uh, here, Gima, again, because we have some online questions, and maybe we won't jump on the stage, but um, can take the questions here. Uh, Before um, moving to questions, if I may uh, explain a bit uh, what you saw on the screen. Uh, most of you probably haven't uh, tried any of these quantification tools that are available. Uh, some features that we have in here, it might look complicated at first glance, but uh, um, I would uh, highlight some features that we have in this tool compared to other tools, also Estonian tools available for the purpose for fee or for free. Uh, here you can navigate between the different um, emission sources freely. There are tools where you have to go through uh, all the emission sectors before you can get any results. And that's rather painful because usually the first time you don't have answers to all the questions, but you cannot get any results before you felt fed in something to each category. Now you can navigate between the categories however you want. And another feature here that we wanted to have is the immediate feedback loop. So once you put in the number, it displays it in the results immediately. And uh, yeah, uh, the graphs are many that might be confusing, but I do hope that for anyone who takes on a serious effort of quantifying a greenhouse gas emissions for an organization finds here actually uh, it's rather easy to put in the activity data and immediately getting results. And Jonas, very briefly before we go to the questions, I know that you have been responsible uh, for doing the greenhouse gas inventory for your company that operates in Finland and Sweden. Would you uh, use it for your next inventory, this tool? Yes, I, I think uh, this tool is really, really useful, especially for um, organizations that, first of all, are relatively new to uh, emission reporting, um, that, that don't, don't have that kind of very scientific knowledge of how emissions are calculated. So it's really straightforward. You log in and you see the top categories and then, then, then you can uh, easily kind of, if you know what you have been doing during a year, 
you can then report report them and you see all the all the uni units and then based on your accounting data or uh, ERP data or what, whatever is your organization's kind of data data storage uh, you can insert them and immediately see the results so it can be a really low low barrier tool for for an organization that that's not very used to these kinds of uh, calculations and especially then many of the commercial tools are they are not very transparent it, it's not um, first of all the pricing can be really hidden somewhere you need to contact them and uh, ask for the pricing and it can be really expensive and you don't really know you what you are kind of buying into before you uh, get the license and then uh, it, 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 it can be really really challenging to compare these tools so the, this is a really kind of um, low low entry point for many organizations On that, another advantage I would like to highlight is the uh, like like I said uh, the tra transparency of pricing uh, in these other other tools can be really poor but also the transparency of the data how, how they are calculated it, it can it, it can be really really challenging so in this tool I'm not sure whether in this version we already have the I can check but any anyway uh, yeah we we have the link uh, to the emission factors this is still uh, we need need to add some some uh, content here but um the idea is that you can track each emission factor down to the uh, source of where 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 that emission factor was was cut from so it immediately becomes uh tra transparent how the emissions are actually calculated and if someone uh because there's now a lot of uh criticism towards organizations green claims and green washing and stuff like that so then if someone criticizes your organization for some emission reporting, then you can actually uh, track down uh, each emission category and emission source to the scientific uh, uh, source of the emission factor that was used. And I would say that that would then uh, be much, much more believable argument than just saying that we are paying Ten thousand dollars for this uh, commercial tool that doesn't tell us anything, but we are trusting that black box platform. And also, I think one more thing, a third, third uh, really, really big advantage uh, for my company, uh, specifically because I'm I'm a software developer and I'm working at a, at a software development company, so it's really kind of um, it's it's not very material heavy or we, we are not selling any physical products but we are we are selling our knowledge basically and our kind of physical footprint is rather small when compared to some manufacturing industry or retail store or something like that so we basically we buy laptops and uh we have offices but that, that's pretty much it otherwise it's just a knowledge work so while this uh, tool has been made for universities in mind, I think many knowledge organizations are really similar to universities. So th this would then be directly applicable to many you know, business, business sector organizations. Uh, the other side of the coin is that then if you are, for example, a factory or um, some grocery store chain or something like that, then these emission categories might not be that suitable for your your specific circumstances but i'd like to highlight that because this tool has been uh, tailored for university setting and why because universities are really knowledge knowledge heavy organizations they are direct, uh, really really kind of similar to many many uh, knowledge knowledge organizations like it sector for example so th those would be my kind of reasons why to uh, use this tool in my uh, work context. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Jonas. We have um, several questions and uh, maybe we can take them so that you have a quick, quick answers. Um, maybe you step a bit uh, mm -hmm. closer to me so that uh, we are we are seen <laughs> also. Uh, Tarbo has written, thank you very much for the powerful presentation. A question. The method of calculation seems pretty straightforward and mathematical. I know from the literature that research have been made for calculating GAG by using methods of deep neural networks and even large language models. Have you considered this or what comments you have for this perspective? Hmm. Uh, the honest answer that is that we haven't considered it. And uh, the kind of main aim here was to connect to the best practice in Estonia and the ministry model. So maybe this kind of more advanced methods could be something to look into in the next steps. And uh, also here, as we wanted to share this, uh, the idea was it that we, we don't make it a commercial endeavor, but we just want to share that this is the way we did it. And if you want to use it, feel free to do so and use our tool, use our emission factors, and we guarantee that it follows the good practice. But uh, this is getting interesting when we get into more advanced methodologies, then Taltec may have to say also globally something about greenhouse gas quantification and making it more advanced. And as pointed out in this question, this is a domain that keeps on developing all the time. Uh, the methods for cities keep on developing. The national inventories are rather stable. They, they are not changing that much, but organizations, cities, buildings that keeps on changing all the time. And, and we have aspects like um, satellite monitoring of the direct emissions coming here, making the quantification more reliable and transparent. So all the time, every year, we have something new to say. And this would be definitely a very interesting methodology to look into. Uh, I would personally not have the competence to do so, but if Daldek has, then that would be a really great step to look into that, start with some journal articles, maybe ex experimental case study, to see what can be improved, what can be done in more advanced way with the knowledge that we have in-house. Uh, three questions. How calculations take into account remote work and study in GAG emissions? Um, <clears throat> remote work um, means less transportation and that's one impact for sure. Uh, as we are also operating with the uh, meter at energy consumption, if there was less consumption in buildings, this is displayed in the results directly. But what we don't have is the energy consumption at home due to the work duties over there. That would be very difficult to, to um, meter. Um, and I think most of the universities and organizations cannot cover this actually, and neither could we. But uh, as it reduced the uh, uh, home to work trips and as it reduced the energy consumption in Taltec buildings, that is covered and reflected in here. Uh, so indeed, there is a knowledge gap there, but uh, this is something that will be tackled also uh, in the roadmap, uh, the, the question of um, remote work and, and study. Yes, and as a quick uh, additional comment to this, there is also the question of um, canteens and food. So if you eat at home, if you have a lunch at home, or if you use a restaurant outside the university, it is usually excluded from university footprint. But if you happen to use our own canteen, then it's included. So here maybe the method is not very logical either, but this is the way it's usually calculated. And it would be also a good question to to maybe discuss or even again write the journal article how how to how to deal with the uh, uh, remote work mm -hmm. emissions. Uh, there is another question related to remote work, and and this is how could twenty percent of remote work and study affect entire GAG output in your opinion? Remote work <clears throat> and study. Yes, as, as we cannot now include the energy consumption or investments needed at home to, to facilitate this homework, this would be a reduction, less energy consumed in buildings, less transportation needed. It would show in our current model as a reduction. 
And if we would find a way through a questionnaire or survey to then quantify the investments and energy consumption at home, there would be probably a slight increase. But my educated guess would be that we would still see a reduction, total reduction. Right now, we would overestimate the impact a bit with this, uh, this data that we have available. With more accurate data, the benefit would be less, but still it would be beneficial. Uh, another wicked uh, but important question. What is so-called measurement uncertainty of GAG emission calculations? That's a good question. Uh, Peter especially has a scientific background for assessing the, the inaccuracy in the results, and we've been discussing this a lot. And um, uh, we cannot ac accurately express this in numbers. But uh, the reason why we started developing this tiered method and uh, this um, accuracy indicator was that we would like to know whether the quality of the result or quality of the source data remains the same over the years or if the accuracy improves. Uh, and uh, do we, we needed to have some kind of metrics to, to monitor this. And we are actually working on a journal article on, on uh, that proposes how we would uh, in a wider sense, uh, um, measure our own input, conduct self-evaluation uh, self of the uh, quality of the data. Uh, also there, I think we cannot get into um, uh, announcing accuracy by numbers. I, I doubt that we cannot do that, as so much is embedded in the emission factors. But at least we can <laughs> propose a framework that helps uh, organizations conducting this kind of self-inventory, a uh, self-evaluation of their inventory quality and the data quality, including accuracy. And uh, the next question is uh, related to the same topic, uh, the accuracy of the data. Uh, how is the footprint of working at university or at home reflected in the model? A lot of our work is done in the cloud or online, so every activity involves energy that is consumed somewhere off the campus. Right. Um, yes. Um, uh, affiliating uh, remote server energy consumption would probably some be something that we would need to report in. That would be scope two, probably energy consumption, although it's not directly here or maybe scope three. Right now we are not covering it. And I know that there are again some journal articles being written about it. Uh, at the moment, I think the standard doesn't provide us any tools to work on that, but uh, that's a fair comment that um, also the indirect impacts of our consumption should be included. And, and again, another question where we should maybe improve. Uh, there is another question. Is there per capita emission factor also for each location like Mustama, Gurasa, Reviruma and so on? Yes, that's in the report. We were using the headcount as it was more solid than FTE. Tartu has the smallest one as the amount of square meters per headcount is uh, smallest over there. And many of these emissions derive from uh, building stock or premises that you use for this operation. That's also briefly addressed in the report. And the last question concerns uh, district heating. Why district heating factor has been taken as constant for baseline scenario, page 10? There are two reasons mentioned in the report. That different buildings re receive heating from different district heating, but there are clear factors for each DH system shown in Annex 4. Another reason was that district heating does not assume any significant reduction till 2035. But Tallinn district heating system have official plans to reach carbon neutrality by 2035. Please comment. Yes. Um, the uh, electricity scenario that we used is by Stokova and Mandmich. Uh, same scenario is used in uh, Estonian carbon footprint methodology for buildings. And that assumes very little change in district heating carbon intensity over the coming years. And based on that, we didn't uh, want to include company-based scenarios as they don't have a common basis for the future assumptions. Probably if we would ask the companies, all of them would announce really fantastic future plans, 
but they are quite soft knowledge and we would need to collect them from four or five district heating providers. If there would be a database where all these companies use the same assumptions and same investment plans and, and on that uh, coherent knowledge would announce their future scenarios until 35, we would use that immediately. But now we were based using this one, one scenario. We know also that the electricity scenario is not good enough for making Estonia carbon neutral, but that's the best scenario we have available at the moment. And as also the carbon footprint method approved by the Ministry of Climate applies this method, we were using that and applied that scenario also assuming that the district heating carbon intensities remain pretty much the same. Uh, this is a very difficult topic. If we start collecting uh, sectoral scenarios and combining them, we probably go wrong because there's no common basis for calculating these scenarios. The best um, international um, document for this kind of um, prognosis is called EU reference scenario that is published every five years. And that has for each country sectoral prognosis developed based on a mathematical model. But for es Estonia, that doesn't match with this scenario that we are using for LCA. So we didn't want to mix two models, but use rather um, uh, modest uh, assumption of the future developments against which we then display our, our, uh, our uh, uh, impact assessment. So if it turns out that the scenario was, um, uh, wasn't ambitious enough, and if the new scenario is authorized, we'd be happy then to also revise the baseline scenario. But uh, we would need this kind of uh, national authorization for the scenario and coherent basis for both district heating and electricity developments. And um, I'm not worried that if it's a bit conservative side on right now, so if the development is better than this, we are actually on the safe side, it would be unfair to show unrealistically optimistic scenarios in our baseline scenario. Uh, with that, uh, that's the end of the questions answers uh, panel. Uh, teile. Kõigile, kes te olite meiega, meid oli üle 130-139 inimest meid jälgimas. See tähendab seda, et huvi tehnika ülikooli kasvuhoone kaaside inventuuri ja tööriista kasti osas on töötajate ja tudengite hulgas suur. See on teekonna algus nagu rektor juba ütles, alustab jaanuari kuust jalajälje teekaardi töögrupp, kuhu kuulub ka professor Kimo Lülükangas oma tiimiga. Ja me oleme siis targemad koos juba järgmise aasta oktoobris. Suuritäh, Kimmo! Kimmo tiimile selle suure töö eest. See töö on praegult inglise keeles, kuid aasta alguses saab see olema ka eesti keeles. Meil tuleb jaanari kuus seminar kõigile kõrkkoolidele ja kutseharidus asutustele ka kõrkkoolidele avalik õiguslikele kutseharjuduskoolidele selleks, et tutustada tööriista kasti võimalusi ja aitame siis ka kaasa mõelda, kuidas kõik kõrkkoolid saaksid seda mudelit kasutada. Samamoodi oleme rõõmsad, et juba ka tehnopol võtab selle tööriista kasti kasutusele, nii et see on meie tagasi hoidlik käejälg juba ühiskonda. Aitäh veelkord kõigele kuulajatele, aitäh Kimmo, Kimmo tiimile ja rahuliku adventiaega ja püsigi terved. Aitäh Helen.